So thank you for being here. If you want to turn, if you don't want to turn, that's between you and the Lord. Uh, Romans chapter 2. We're going to try and get through uh, verses 5 through 16. Once again, the uh, title of our study this morning, There is No Partiality with God. So I'm going to read uh, uh, verses 1 through 16, and uh, we'll just go over 5 through 16. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who practice, or you who judge, practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of all the self, uh, all the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who, by patient continuance and doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. I think Paul, if he was in a modern English class, he would be given an F right out the gate. I mean, he is just noted for his sentence that just keep running on and running on and running on. But thankfully, the Holy Spirit used him as a pen. And you know what? That's not going to be a problem as we read Scripture. So as we continue to um, read of God's judgment, uh, we're, we're going to learn, we're going to hear, we're going to uh, understand that what Paul is talking about is those that are self-righteous. The self-righteous will, will have to give an account. Uh, the religious, the religious will have to give an account. And I want to bring out three truths that uh, we're not going to get to all of them today, but, uh, but, but these are the three truths. Number one, God's truth is the bar by which we will be judged. So it's God's truth. You know what? You... Even though you might be better than that chicken standing next to you, that is not going to get you anything other than feeling good about yourself, which is called flesh, which is called sin. And you're not going to get a leg up on that chicken next to you, even though you might be thinking you're, you're doing good, because God's truth is the bar, not what you're doing compared to them. Number two, a person's deeds will be judged based upon the light that they have. Now, that's kind of, could be a, a tad bit conflicting for a moment. But what Paul is bringing forth here is he's dealing with the self-righteousness of the Jews in this chapter that we're in here. The, the thought that self as a Jew is better than those that aren't Jewish. The thought that because we have Abraham our father, we got a leg up, right? We got Abraham, we got it over here on you guys. Well, we got the commandments. Well, we got over. We got the law. Well, we got it over. Well, we've been called to go um, do this and go do that, and we got a leg up on you guys. And and really, what that ends up resulting in is a self righteousness, a sense that, ha, I got mine, you don't. I'm good, and you're not. And although Paul is addressing the Jews and the scriptures we're going through this. Week, I think it's very important that all of us uh, have an understanding that we 
might fall in that same hole, that we might fall in that same category. Because I know a lot of saved sinners, those that have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I know that they forget a lot of times that they're sinners, right? I know that they're saved, they remember that part of the equation, but they forget that they're saved sinners. They forget that the old man is still capable of welling up with inside, capable of bringing forth uh, fruits of unrighteousness. And, and we forget that. We, we look upon those who either don't know the Lord or we look upon those who have a relationship with the Lord, but perhaps uh, they're at the infancy of that. They're, they're in the milk of their relationship, not the meat of their relationship. And we judge, and we judge partially. And what we do is we take, and then by that judging, we heap up condemnation upon ourselves, right? Remember John 3.16, for God so loved the world that what he gave his only God the Son, that the Lord should live in him. Verse 17 is something that we need to really remember. For God did not send his Son into the world to what? Condemn him. The world's already condemned. They're already going to hell in the handbasket. And so as Paul is now speaking to the Jews in our scriptures this week, what he wants them to be aware of is that they are not going to take and get ahead in this race by keeping those things which are outward appearance only, right? So many of us, we look good on the outside, but we're like those dead men walking, those sepulchers on the inside. You know, the outside looks all shiny and new, but underneath it is a bunch of rust. You know, we have a couple of car guys in here today, I think. And they look at, like warning almost got whiplash. My God, what? Okay, oh, gals, and gals too. You know, I got, I got an old car home. And you know, no matter how much I put the blinders on, and go, oh, look at that thing, it looks so awesome. You know, I know where, I know where the rust was. I can look at the fender lips, and I can see where a little bit of water is hung out there and made itself home, and the paint's starting to bubble a little bit, and things are going on, and but the outward appearance to most looks awesome and, and shiny and new. But to me, who really knows that car inside? Now, eh, you know, it's a good looker from about 100 miles, and then only then if you're looking at the, with the backside of your head. And and so in that, the Jews, the Jews looked at the Gentiles, and if you if you will, the Gentiles were the foils for the Jews. You know, as long as they look really bad we could say we look really good. As long as they were doing this, well, we weren't doing that at least, and they wouldn't, the Jews wouldn't address what was going on. But the Lord sees the heart. The Lord knows the heart. And at the end of the day, those things that we do, we're either going to uh, testify to the fact that we know and we love the Lord, or they're going to take and they're going to be gathered up and will be held accountable to all this. And he's making the same truth known to the Jews. Let me read uh, our verses uh, this morning, verses 5 through 11. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent or unrepentant hearts, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds, <coughs> eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. See, what God wanted the Jews to understand as well as the Gentiles or the way the same church, he wanted them to understand God is not partial. God is not partial. He, his scales are the same. You know, well, I hung out with him a whole lot longer. I mean, Old Testament a whole lot longer than you, you New Testament dogs 
who've been in the family. So obviously we got a leg up on you guys. It doesn't work that way. God judges, and there is no partiality with God. And, and Paul penned this as now he addresses the Jews. Reading out of Romans chapter 2, I'm going to go back a verse. This is the ESV, um, I guess, uh, definition. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? That's a question. See, God is long-suffering. God is kind. God is patient for the purpose of leading the unrepentant, leading the hard-hearted to know who he is, to come to that. That but repentance. It says here, read it again, Romore. Or do you boom? Do you present a presumption in the world? Presumption goes in the hey, he's not saying he's going to go. I mean that he's going to do to be kind to this to me. But he says, not that God's kind meant to lead you. God's kindness, not uh, or it is him acting with you uh, and your sin. It, it does the word in with you and what you're doing. It does not get him saying, yeah. Not even good culture, no good thing, political system. Got yeah, you come changing a little bit here and just come along and say, that's not where I am. God is his truth. And his is what? The cancer. Never change. Well, God never changed. And so in verses 5 through 11, he says, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. They're storing up, they're acquiring. It's like a savings account. Give me more of that stuff. Give, give me more, just give me more. And they don't realize that God, what? He doesn't judge the outward. He judges what? The heart of men. He judges the inward, and only he can see that. He understands the, the motives. He knows what's going on, and... As, as Paul writes this to the church at Rome, there's a, there's a suspicion that those who are not the church in Rome will also hear this. And so Paul wants to inform the church, but he also wants to inform the rulers that perhaps uh, are going to listen and, and understand what they're doing. goes on to say in verse 7, eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of a man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. See, there's going to become that moment when those things that we do, that we've done in the flesh, will be judged. Those things that we do and we do in the flesh they will paint a picture of who we are. It's hard sometimes to be in a fellowship and somebody participating in a thing might be viewed as on the of what is I'll just leave. And sometimes we, we things and it may work to go to not the prayer of the Pharisee, oh, okay, Lord of all life. But for those people, we're the, the press, right? Lord, wrap your arms with, you know, we're encouraging them. How are you doing? But, but there are others in the congregation that, you know, they're keeping up, keeping their knees a bit, they're keeping their class. And they are the best, and by the power of the Holy Spirit and the information that they have, because that's what this is about as well, the information that you have, to magnify and glorify. Lord. You know, and, and so we're not to be busy bodies. We're not to take and be uh, fruit examiners, although in a, in a sense, maybe in a little bit we are. But what we're to do is we're to pray for all men. We're to take and pray for those that spitefully use us and pray for those that um, appear to not understand what the Lord would have them to do. Back to verse 8, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, 
indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of a man who does evil, of the Jew first and also the Greek. So God is pulling everyone together. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Think of life as a savings account. What are you reaping? What are you storing? What are you throwing in that account? Reading out of Job 34, 19. Yet he is not partial to princes, nor does he regard the rich more than the poor. They are all the work of his hands. Shouldn't that encourage us? Shouldn't that incredibly uplift us? That there is, there is no basis in our physical wealth. There is no basis in our physical um, health. There is no basis in, in the things that we've acquired, our status in life, what family we were born into. Um, there's, there's, there's no partiality with God. It's a level surface. It's, and we want that, don't we? I want that level surface. I mean, I don't want to be that guy who gets on a team and I got a I get an advantage. Oh man, I, I, I love that the Lord judges impartially. I love that. Because you know what? That puts us all on the same level with the same rules, on the same team or not on the team. And I think that's incredible. Proverbs 118, but they lie and wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. Speaking of those who judge others, those who use others. Jeremiah 17, 10, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his womb. Job 24, 13, there are those who rebel against the light. They do not know its ways, nor abide in its See, so many of us make following the Lord difficult. Right? We do. I want to go do this. Okay, can you say, I want to go do this? You certainly can say, I want to go do this. Most of us do that once or twice or multiple times during the day, a week, a month, a year, our life. But should the question be, Lord, what will you have me to do? How will this work today? What would you have me to say to this person? How would you have me to interact with this person? What might you desire of me this day? And as Paul speaks to the Jews, he's telling them, look, you, you are on the same level as those Jews. What he's telling them, get right. Before it's late. Because I think many of us can say we have not acted who's acted to judge our righteousness, that we didn't think we were in the bunch. We didn't have thoughts. Um, I saw because nobody else saw us. We were good to go. We kept thinking those. And see, of course, it's just for a year. Out of Ephesians chapters 1, 2, be made alive, dead, and trust in sin. So, so I might, the grammar and the means words too little, but I talked about this on Tuesday, and, and as I look at King James or as the Bible, that forward with the desire that those weren't as educated as others, and I know I didn't say my school as you for one year or something else. But yeah, the king was brought forward, so I'm a man might understand. So maybe I put to what old in Ephesians, but over it's the words, and you he life who were dead trespassed in sin, in which you walked into the course of the world, according to of the power of the spirit, who now in the son disobedient, of whom also we once conducted ourselves in the house of our fulfilling the desires of the, of the mind, and were the children of God, just as the others. Talking about being children of God, just as others. Talking to the Jews, telling them, no lies, the thing you do in yourself, right? The things you do in your judgment, the thing you don't do. Those all being stored up, all being related. And those things will define who you are. Those are the things, they don't save you. Certainly peak 
Perhaps you have a relationship with the Lord, but they So I'm going to go on in verse of Ephesians 2. But God, in mercy, because of his grace with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Pretty simple, right? It is the gift of God. Not of works. So Jews listen up. Gentiles listen up. Church listen up. Not of works, least anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Pretty simple, huh? Pretty simple. God, what do you want me to do? Well, worship me. God, how do I do that? Well, have you given over your life to me? Oh, God, I think I have. Be clear. Have you read my word? Oh, I'm so in tune with you. I, I don't got to do that. Come on, that's old stuff, man. How old is this stuff? The Old Testament, New Testament. I mean, it's got to be like six, seven. No, I don't need that. It's, it's old, man. It's kind of moldy in a few places, too. No, but Lord, just like speak to me, and I'll do what? No. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, which God, uh, Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Verse 11, therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Pretty straightforward. So, <clears throat> if God so loved that he so gave, if we receive the free gift that we might glorify him, if we who were once so far off have now been brought close, who should have the preeminence in our life? And why is that so difficult? I mean, I'm breathing because he desires that I still breathe. I mean, they don't call it voluntary breath. You know, the little metronome in the head, Dick breathe, dick breathe, dick breathe. I don't have a metronome for my heart, right? If I did, I'd be dead. Well, if I did or I didn't, I'd be dead. If, I had to, if, if my heart beat, it depended upon me, my breathing, I wouldn't be here. But it's the love of God. Verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you, or far off, and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God and Spirit. God has a plan. And his plan is not for us to be busybodies. His plan for us is not to take and uh, go through a checklist or a litany of things that uh, make us acceptable to him. I go to church. I give money. I participate. Ah, ah. Do you love the Lord with all your heart and your soul and your mind? And are you offering up you yourself 
as an offering of worship to him. Right? Are you giving him your home? Are you, are you going to do that 24-7? Nah, scripture says pretty much for golf, seven, seven daily. If we say we don't, we call him a liar. So that's where the saved sinner part comes in. Confess, repent, be restored. You don't lose your salvation. It's all, it's all happy. But Paul, as he's dealing with the Jews, wants them to know that it's not those works that set them apart. It's the cross of Christ, and we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. But that's information that the church needs to hear as well. Verses 12 through 16. For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in between themselves, their thoughts, accusing or else excusing them. And the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Christ Jesus, according to my gospel. See, every man coming into the world, and this is all inclusive to everybody, men, women, this is all inclusive. They have a light. They have, they have an understanding. They have a conscience. And in that, whether they know who Jesus Christ is or they don't know who he is, they innately know right from wrong. They do know right from wrong. And and if that's the only light that they have coming into the world, then these works that they do will be illuminated by that light, right or wrong, the, the moral that was written in their heart. And I'm not talking salvifically, I'm talking in, in the words. They will be judged by the light that they have. If somebody's been given the full gospel, and they've received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, their light is going to be a little bit different, huh? It's going to be a little bit more full, a little bit more dramatic, and, and, and they know what to do because they have the Holy Spirit within them. The Jews, they say they have this, but yet in having this, they can't obey the law. They don't obey the law. They have the law as a shield. And in that, the law is not going to save them. Christ came to what? Fulfill the law. The law is not a salvific instrument in the toolbox of salvation. But the law causes us to understand the need of a Savior. And so what Paul is saying here is those without the law will perish without the law. Those who sin in the law will be judged by the law. The Gentiles who do not have the law by nature uh, do the things on the law so that that understanding of these, although not having the law, or a lot of themselves. So, so the things that they do, even though they don't have the law, that becomes that which will expose what they're doing. In verse 16, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Christ Jesus, according to my gospel. I want to read uh, out of John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of His fullness we have all received in grace for grace. Verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared them. Have you been recipients of the grace of God? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you confessed? Have you repented? Has the very death of Jesus Christ become the propitiation for your sins? His death, his resurrection, and his ascension, has that resulted in the Holy Spirit now indwelling you? I mean, that's a personal question, right? 
You know, that's, that's a personal question. Are you saved? How do I know? You have the Holy Spirit, that's how you know. Well, I don't know. And then you need to go back and figure out, has God done a work in your life? Has he poured out his grace upon you? Has he opened your eyes, dead eyes, that were once dead, now I was once blind, but now I see you? And it's important because we don't want to be a church, a fellowship, an assembly of believers that go out and do good deeds with wicked hearts. That makes sense? They're mostly going to see your deeds, and only the Lord's going to see the wickedness that's in your heart. But what we want to do is we want to sit before the Lord. We want to say, Lord, what would you have me to do this day? Lord, speak to me, guide me, direct me, and Lord, reveal if there is any wicked way within me, right? Because that's the only way we deal with things. I mean, back to my car. Man, if my car was a, a living, beating organism, man, there's all kinds of things wrong with that puppy. There's rust over here, there's leaks over here, there's things over, and for me, I can just go like this and I can, I can just close my eyes and not pretend that it isn't there, just ignore it because there's nothing I can do about it, just not in that place, you know? But not so much with the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not so much with the temple of the Holy Spirit. If there's things that we need to rearrange, uh, recalculate, remember the old Garmin systems? You know, I used to love messing with the Garmin lady, you know, because you go down the street, and I've lived around here forever, so you, you take a turn that you want to take, but the Garmin lady doesn't want you to take it. Recalculating! You know, and it's always, I, I picture my German ancestor somewhere just, you know, saying that into the Garmin recording. And I used to like to mess with the Garmin lady, you know, just, hey, you're mad at that one, watch this one, you know, go another shortcut. But you know what? If, if you're in the midst of wrong turns, if you're in the midst of uh, having an outward appearance that uh, is far different from what's going on in, inside, you know, confess, repent, turn. Go forward. I mean, it's simple as that, right? And as we go forward next week, and we go on to verses 17 and on, um, read ahead. Um, somebody had said to me um, prior to coming up, uh, you know, I'm going to be listening to what you're saying. I'm going to tell you if you're wrong. And I'm like, that's awesome. No, it is. That's awesome. I, I think that's the most incredible thing in the world because I wake up in the morning much like a lot of you. But don't you wake up wanting to be right? I mean, I do. I don't want to wake up in the morning and think I'm, oh, here it goes, old you are, I'm going to be wrong on everything. No, I wake up, I want to be right. But I am open to be wrong. And so I'd love for you guys to read ahead, study ahead, uh, have the Lord speak to you uh, on our scriptures next week. And, uh, you know, accountability is something that we all should desire. Right? And that's what that's what Paul is saying to the, to the Jews. You're going to be accountable. That's what he said in the prior chapter one. You're going to be accountable. And so in that, um, you know what? Pay attention because we're going to be coming. Amen?